Hi, thanks for clicking in. My name is Silas. I'm a researcher at Washington State University, and um, I hope you're enjoying the workshop so far. I have prepared a couple of slides for you um, on the so-called taxonomic impediment, what the taxonomic impediment is, and how the taxonomic impediment affects bees. And yeah, I hope you're having a good time, and I'm looking forward to discussions on this topic later. Um, as you've heard in Michael's talk, taxonomy is basically the science of biological classification, the description of species, the identification of species, and you know, kind of the categorization of species in a hierarchical system. An implicit goal of the field of taxonomy is the documentation of life on Earth. So what do we actually know about life on Earth, numbers-wise? Numbers um, well, of course, we don't know how many species there are actually on Earth, but there's this website, the Catalog of Life, which uh, regularly um, publishes updates on species numbers. And I think it's kind of a cool website to look at every once in a while. Last week, we were at nearly 1.4 million species of animals on Earth. So yeah, quite a few. Of course, estimates of the true diversity on Earth vary significantly. And there have been estimates that went up to, you know, like 100, spe 100 million species. And I want to highlight one particular study that I think is pretty cool. And that is the study um, from Terry Irvin from 1982. Uh, I think you can really say this was a groundbreaking, groundbreaking publication in which Terry Irvin estimated that there may be up to 30 million species of arthropods in tropical rainforests worldwide. How did he come to this number? He used a method called uh, canopy fogging. So this is a method where the scientists basically, you know, bring this device in to the tropics and fog up, you know, uh, the canopy of trees, thereby basically trying to kill every possible insect or arthropod that is associated with the tree, which then rain down and then are collected in these um, white, basically with these sheets there, and then are later, you know, sorted and potentially identified. The results of the study, um, for these results, Irvin forked up 19 species of trees and counted species, actually without identification and basically more or less sorting them to morphospecies. And he recovered about 1,200 species of beetles, of which he thought 800 may be herbivores. Of those 800 herbivores, he considered 13.5% of those as specialists for specific trees. And with this number, he multiplied by the by an approximate number of species of trees that were you know, available in the tropics or occurring in the tropics. And those were approximately 50,000 species. And this is how he got to the number of around 8 million species of beetles. He added another 12 million species of other tree-bound arthropods, and then added another 10 million species for, you know, ground-dwelling arthropods. And this is how he got to the this really impressive number of 30 million species, which is really quite a lot. I mean, can this be right? Well, we don't truly know. However, this was really, you know, the dawn of a new field. Modern estimates are actually quite a bit lower. So we're now thinking of more about, there was this recent review paper from Stork in 2018, and they considered um, probably around 7 million species, but, you know, with big mar margins of error left and right. And he also used this famous quote, which I think is really cool, that to a good approximation, all species are insects, just because insects are truly the vast, vast majority of species on Earth. Well, if you consider 7 million species, that would actually mean that we have about 80% of species that remain still to be discovered or described. So we may have, we may be at 20% right now. And if it, you know, took us about 300 years to get to 20%, I mean, we can kind of make some hand wavy estimates that it may actually take us another thousand years or so until, you know, we as a scientific community have described every single species. However, there is another problem, and that is the problem of extinction. So present day, basically human driven extinction rates are likely a lot, lot higher than what we consider a background extinction. So a natural rate of extinction. And we're probably looking at something like a thousand or maybe even 10,000 times greater than a natural extinction rate. So the take home here, however, is that there are lots of unknowns. And these unknowns basically lead us straight into the taxonomic impediment. The taxonomic impediment is a increasingly widely discussed and used term 
We can see this here in this graph on the left side, papers addressing the taxonomic impediment um, are becoming increasingly more common. So it's a term that is more used in recent papers. I wasn't actually really able to track down where exactly the term is from. However, it is a term that is increasing in popularity across both the vertebrate and the invertebrate literature. However, primarily invertebrates. The taxonomic impediment basically comes down to, through, uh, to three significant issues. The first one is a large gap of taxonomic knowledge or an incomplete understanding of a you know, largely known or a largely unknown biodiversity. The second one are the insufficient human resources or the personnel. So in short, the number of trained experts for the respective group is insufficient or perceived as insufficient. And the third point is the taxonomic infrastructure does not meet the demands. So taxonomic infrastructure in this case are, you know, for example, non-existing non reference collections. And let's talk about some of these, well, actually all three of those points in a little bit more detail. The first one is the large gaps of taxonomic knowledge. Well, specifically for bees, as of August 2022, we consider 20,759 valid species of bees. And um, this number is based on the discoverlife.org um, checklist, which is maintained by John Asher. And it's truly, I think, you know, a fascinating resource. I really hope that we will be able to enjoy this for many more years to come, because I think it's one of our most powerful tools right now to actually address the taxonomic impediment. And a number of you know, additional graphs that I show in the next slides are based on data that I mined from this checklist. Um, bees are considered to be, uh, well, experts agree that there are likely you know, seven families of bees, 28 seven, uh, subfamilies and about 69 tribes. You know, the latter, you know, what makes a tribe or a tribe experts sometimes disagree on. Interestingly, we have nearly 13,000 species of bees that have synonyms. What that tells us is that there actually has already been a lot of taxonomic work and a lot of taxonomic revision in bees. However, we still have a ways to go. Let's look at the next graph here. So what we see here is basically a species accumulation curve of bees. So this is the number of valid described species, how they um, were described through time. And what we, see, what we see here is, you know, the first species were described by Linné around 1758. And he described all at once 30 species. There has been a really, you know, rapid rate of description around 1900, between uh, shortly after 1900, especially 1905 until, you know, 1915, basically right to the beginning of the First World War. There was a decrease during the Second World War, which is kind of a general pattern across groups of insects. However, since the 60s, there has really been a pretty steady, you know, accumulation of newly described bee species, and even a slight uptick since 2005. Another way of looking at this data is here in these five-year intervals. Again, we see a really you know, productive time around 1913. Then there's this dip um, during World War II or shortly thereafter. And the last one here that we see is basically the present day is not complete yet. So I think this will even out a little bit. Looking at the last 20 years more specifically, of course, there's an up and down, but you know, it's actually a fairly, I would say it's surprisingly stable. 2021 was not a good year. However, overall, there's an average of around 126 newly described species of bees um, in the world. And I think this is a, is a pretty decent number. How many species of bees exist globally? Well, to be honest, I don't know. And I hope um, that this is something that we can actually discuss a little bit today. I would be really curious to hear what other people think or guesstimate. My personal guess is probably between 32 and 35,000 species, just because I think that the you know, number or the amount of cryptic species in bees is a little bit higher than in other groups of insects. From a spatial perspective, specifically for the US, so here's a map of the US, and I'm now going to color um, states that have either a published checklist a near complete checklist, or, you know, I know of a significant effort that is underway that will hopefully lead to a checklist. Um, and I apologize if I forget, if I forgot a state here, um, please, you know, feel free to let me know if I, if I did so. This was kind of like more like a, um, yeah, a search of a couple hours. 
However, I think that we can estimate that approximately half of all the US states um, have a checklist or may have a checklist in the near future. And I think this exemplifies some pretty significant you know, spatial gaps that we are facing. I wanna highlight one specific checklist that I think is pretty cool. And that is the one from Pennsylvania. Um, started out with this paper in 2010 by Donovan and Van Engelsdorf. And um, they recovered 372 species for the state of Pennsylvania. There has been an update in 2022 by Shelby Kilpatrick. Um, she added another, like a little over like 101 species to the checklist. And then shortly thereafter, there was another update with a couple, um, uh, with a couple of fixes. And what I want to say here is I think checklists are incredibly useful tools. And I think for checklists in particular, it is really the case that perfect is the enemy of the good. You know, checklists, if they're work in progress or if a preliminary checklist, they are incredibly useful for taxonomists, for ecologists, basically anyone working with bees. So I really hope that we can increase the number of checklists in the US in the next years. Because this checklist from Pennsylvania really, you know, improved our understanding of, you know, spatial bee biodiversity for the state on a county level. I think this is a great study. Moving on to the second aspect of the taxonomic impediment, and those are the insufficient human resources or personnel. Um, that breaks down into a couple of points. First is the number, and probably foremost, the number of trained experts for the respective group, in our case, bees, is insufficient or is perceived as insufficient. And I want to show you a plot here um, that I thought is kind of interesting. So this is the number of published papers in two separate fields. Um, these are the green line are publications on native or wild bee ecology and conservation versus the number of publications in native or wild bee taxonomy, systematics, or you know, basically revisionary studies. And this is maybe not an exhaustive list, um, but it certainly gives us a really good picture that there has been a significantly increased demand in bee identification. And this is primarily driven by the literature outside of taxonomy, especially ecological and conservation. Um, and so what I'm thinking, or I don't have hard numbers about how many you know, bee taxonomists there were 20 or 30 or 50 years ago. But what I'm thinking is not only is the number of tax the is the number of you know bee taxonomists not increasing, but it's actually also that the demand for bee taxonomy or identification skills is rapidly increasing. So yeah, definitely a check here. Um, however, on top of that, I think there's an additional issue. And that is not only that you know, we may not have enough taxonomists, but I think that there's a lack of employment opportunities for taxonomists. Because, you know, looking around, I think there's actually a fair number of people that are really interested in bee taxonomy that, you know, can see themselves working in the field. However, you know, there are not a lot of, you know, actually paid jobs where people could professionalize this interest. I do think um, that Aging communities and basically losing knowledge through age is certainly a problem. Um, it's a problem that a lot of other insect groups um, basically experience as well. And I think bees are no exception here. Lastly, in this aspect, I want to touch on the changing roles of museums, or at least how I feel they are kind of changing. So um, I'm not talking about any specific museum here, uh, especially not in the US. However, just to make sure that no one feels attacked, you know, I <laughs> just picked a a stock image from a major museum outside of the US. Um, museums really used to be the center of species discovery, and to a good extent, they still are. So the vast majority of species used to be actually described um, in museums. However, at the same time, I think that museums are changing a little bit, and I think there are significant gaps that we have in US natural history museums. And one is that um, there, I, at least not to my knowledge, and you know, please correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think that there's currently a single you know, specific bee curator at any of the natural history museums in the US. And I think that's a real gap. There has been a documented decline of the number of invertebrate curators across you know, US natural history, natural history museums in you know, a number of different fields. 
in a number of different museums, for example, at the Field Museum, but also the number at the um, Smithsonian is uh, of, you know, employed invertebrate curators is going down. And on top of that, um, a lot of, you know, museum support staff is, you know, declining as well. And those are, you know, real issues that are kind of happening behind the scene that, you know, we may actually not be quite aware of. There has also been a bit of a changing role of a curator in natural history museums. Um, you know, nowadays curators are also kind of evaluated based on kind of similar criteria than faculty at universities. Basically, you know, extra moral funding, how many grants, and also how I impact our particular papers and so forth. And I think that um, current evaluation criteria are not necessarily aimed at strengthening, you know, taxonomic outputs, big taxonomic revisions that take a long time to develop and, you know, are basically just one paper after maybe five years. The last point of the taxonomic impediment is the taxonomic infrastructure, of course, a big deal. Does the taxonomic infrastructure meet the demands of us, basically, of, as a scientific community? Um, specifically, I am talking about, um, you know, reference collections. Are reference collections available or not? Reference collections can be an incredible resource for identifying, especially when people are starting out. Um, other lack of resources could be identification keys, illustrations, images, documentations, checklists, and so forth. And one of the reasons why we're running this workshop is because we actually want to really hear from you what you think. Where are the gaps in the taxonomic infrastructure? Um, there are, you know, still papers published behind paywalls. There is a, a fair amount of inaccessible literature. Museum and collection digitization, you know, is certainly always a, a small bottleneck. Um, and kind of a little bit outside of our scope, I guess, is also that permitting processes can be very challenging. Um, there are states in the US where it is currently impossible to actually legally collect insects, um, including bees. And I think, you know, this is something that should be at least, you know, discussed today. So the taxonomic impediment, and these are just a couple of thoughts here, prevents us to do large scale assessments of pollinator communities. They prevent us from understanding historical change and they hamper our ability to develop a sound basis of knowledge for a number of things, including policy making, conservation effort, sustainable agriculture, and so forth. I want to close my talk with um, just two examples of survey studies that I really liked. The first one is a paper by Paul Rhodes um, on the native bee fauna of the Palouse Prairie, including um, people from the Logan Bee Lab. The Palouse Prairie is an area in northwestern um, North America in the Pacific Northwest. Actually, when I look out my window here, I'm looking straight at the Palouse Prairie. Uh, it's a beautiful area um, and kind of fairly understudied in terms of bee biodiversity. So what Paul did in this paper is that he collected for two summers at 32 sites throughout the Palouse Prairie, collected a total of 13,000 specimens, so a pretty impressive number, and he identified 174 species in 29 genera, and 42 of those species remained unidentified. Let's look at this in more detail. So the big genera that Paul was not able to identify, um, and you know, I would not have been able to identify those either, and I think a lot of people would not have been so as a remember, you know, yeah, we are looking at nomada with uh, almost 40% 40, 40 of all species, as well as Ficodes, Stelis, and Melisodes. Um, a typical bee that a lot of people struggle with is actually not on this list here, and that is Lasioglossum. However, Lasioglossum was actually the most abundant genus with 32%, and of those, 75% were part of the Hemihalicta series. So, and these bees in the study were actually not sorted to morpho species. So they were just counted. So, and what I want to basically have you take home from here is, okay, this was a study done by people that really know what they're doing, you know, among the best bee experts that we know of. And um, yet, you know, about a third of all the species that were recovered were not identified. And I think this is remarkable because it really shows, you know, a taxonomic impediment in bees for North America. Particularly problematic taxa here were Nomada, Sphicodes, and Lasioglossum, and to a lesser extent, Melisodes and Osmia. Lastly, I want to touch on a study that I really like from uh, Bob Minkley um, that he carried out in the San Bernardino Valley. Uh, it's a great paper. I encourage you to read it. Um, 
a long running sampling, Bob visited over 40 sites uh, like, so, like, on a regular basis and collected. And in total, he collected about 74,000 specimens, which he pinned and identified to species if possible. And I think this is a monumental task and I really admire you know, this project. Um, Bob identified around 400, basically around 500 species and 73 of those only as morpho species. How do those look? Um, like Paul, Bob was basically struggling with nomada. However, there's also another group that was an issue here and that is Euphoria, as well as Stelis and Andrina. So if we look here at the, you know, most problematic taxa, we, there is certainly, there's overlap. That is Nomada again, Euphoria, Stelis, Andrina, and to a lesser extent, Mega Kylie and Lazy of Lawson. And um, I'm sure a lot of, some of you, at least I have, struggled with the same genera, you know, a lot. And I hope that, you know, we can discuss how we can move forward with this um, in this workshop. Yeah. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention and um, I will see you soon.